So I'm pleased to welcome in the studio with me now Patrick McIntosh. Good morning. Good morning. So I spoke to you on the on the phone on the 29th of December. You were just about to set off for your trek. How did it all go? Well, it went unbelievably well, uh, although you have to say the margin between error and uh, success is wafer thin. In other words, there are so many things that can possibly go wrong and to some extent did go wrong, particularly in terms of getting on to Antarctica and getting back off Antarctica was very Mm -hmm. unpredictable. But uh, yeah, we had a fantastic trip and it was extremely uh, uh, successful. So when you set out to do this trip, did you give yourself a particular kind of day time in when how far to do it? And did you manage to achieve that? We did. I mean, we we hoped that we would do it in 15 days, but Mm -hmm. of course, weather and fitness and uh, 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 terrain, etc. makes it very difficult. We actually managed to achieve it in 11 days, which was 11 days and and a bit, which was quite extraordinary. Um, We weren't quite sure in the end whether we were motivated by the fact that we were just so tired and filthy that we and smelly that we just wanted to get home to get a bath. We're not quite sure. But (laughs) anyway, we, we did it. And somewhat remarkably, we also hoped that we might arrive on the 103rd anniversary of Scott's arrival Mm. at the South Pole. And we managed to achieve that, which was uh, quite extraordinary. But that was more purely by luck than judgment. Yes. So you managed to do it in the less time. That's great. Well, we were travelling at uh, over 20 kilometres a day Mm -hmm. in very, very harsh conditions. It's Mm. the equivalent of running a marathon every day, dragging a sledge, which is weighing 55 kilos, 4,000 metres above sea level with an average temperature of minus 30. Uh, it's a very, very exhausting mm, uh, I can imagine. effort. And it's mentally, actually, it was more exhausting than physically, actually. So you say we, who were you with? So uh, we did it completely unassisted. It was just myself and a guy called Conrad Dickinson. Mm -hmm. Conrad took Prince Harry and Walking with the Wounded to the South Pole last year. Did a phenomenal uh, attempt. Uh, And and as he said, um, to think of it in terms of there were four men with only three legs between them, that makes you realise quite how challenging it was for them. But they at least had some support and assistance. We actually had no support and assistance. So once we had been abandoned on the ice, uh, we had no means of uh, being rescued, etc. So if it had gone wrong, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Wow, that, that's actually quite a scary thought. Yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> it was quite uh, sobering when I, we realised quite how you know vulnerable we were mm. to the elements. And what did your family think about that? Uh, I think without question, everybody thought I was completely mad and I think <laughs> they still think I'm completely insane. Uh-huh. But they're very grateful that I somehow got through it and got back out. It's not the first time, though, you've done something like this, is it? No, I've done a few other extreme things, although nothing... I don't think there will be anything in the world that beats walking to the South Pole. Mm. But after my bowels came out, um, I walked up Kilimanjaro as a means of getting fit. Um, I've also sailed across the Atlantic and a few other bits and pieces. So I have done a few odd bits and pieces. I've walked the Hort route from Chamonix to Zermatt over the Matterhorn and uh, been up uh, uh, Mont Blanc and things like that. So, yeah, it's a, in, in the scale of things, though, this was unbelievably more difficult. Mm-hmm. And I met somebody actually uh, at the end of the trip who had climbed Everest, and he reckoned that actually walking to the South Pole was significantly more exhausting than climbing Everest. Yes, because of course we spoke last time, um, you had three different cancers within the space of 13 months. Yeah. And, well, you're here, you, you've survived it. I mean, was these trips because of the cancers or were you always adventurous? No, it was precisely because of the cancers. I thought of what could... I, I've been incredibly lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I thought, well, how can I repay society? How can I mm-hmm. raise awareness? So the whole issue of going to the South Pole was really the hook to raise awareness. Mm-hmm. Awareness about the fact that if you're incredibly lucky like I am, you can catch... Can, if you catch cancer early, mm-hmm. whether it be... I've had bowel, I've had my bowels removed, I've had radical prostatectomy, I've had skin cancer... Um, 
whatever it is, if you're alive to the symptoms and you get it caught early, it is very, very remarkable how likely it is that you can get through your cancer and, and live a perfectly normal life. The tragedy of cancer is that most people don't know it mm. until it's far too yes. advanced, particularly in bowel cancer, which is why it's the second largest uh, early death killer in the UK. And yet it needn't be. But unfortunately, we just don't know we've got it until it's too late. And so my awareness thing mm -hmm. is about... A, get yourself checked out if you yes. have any suspicions. B, try and improve your diet. Try and eat better foods. Try and take a little bit more exercise. And if you can do all those things, the chances are that you will live a long life in good health. And if you do get cancer and you catch it early, like me, it can be removed. And then you can carry on with your life as if nothing has happened. So trekking to the South Pole must have been a challenge in itself. But what kind of challenges did you face? extreme coldness I mean there was there were days when we walked in a pea soup you couldn't see anything you had no horizon you actually got quite sick and dizzy from Ooh. the fact that you had no means of knowing what was up and down mm -hmm. you had to concentrate on the compass you've got no electronic means of getting there you literally have to do it by dead reckoning with a compass all of the electronic wizardry that we're used to in the 21st mm -hmm. century goes out the window and in such a harsh place so you're walking in a pea soup the wind can be blowing so that the, chill minus, uh, the chill, wind chill factor can be minus 40 um, and, and you're doing it for hours and hours and hours on end and, and, and basically you're, <clears throat> you're traveling or you're putting up your tent or taking down your mm -hmm. tent for a 10 hours a day uh, and then you're absolutely exhausted. Then you've got to try and feed yourself, you've got to try and get some sleep uh, and then you've got to do it all over again and so the mental challenge was yeah was enormous and yet at the same time the unbelievable experience of being and what can only really be described as it's a bit like being an astronaut I mean yeah. you are completely isolated you're on a continent the size of Europe with nothing nothing no animals no life no no horizon nothing on it at all just two people walking across a completely barren landscape um, and so that in itself is quite an ethereal experience. And then some days the sun would shine and you would have things like a panhaligon, which is a, an amazing view of the sun, which has a halo around it. So you get something like eight suns all at the same wow. time um, <laughs> uh, reflected in the uh, uh, atmosphere. An extraordinary. Uh, if you, if anybody wants to look up a panhaligon on the on on their, their uh, iPads and so forth, you'll be amazed what it looks like. And we were lucky enough to see two of them. They're not a, a common event, um, but they were were well, extraordinary. I'm definitely going to look that up. I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever come to a point where you felt I cannot go on? I've got to give up. I must admit, at the start, I think of the third day. Um, I was absolutely exhausted mm -hmm. um, and I thought to myself, my God. And also one of the other big issues that one doesn't appreciate is that you're, the air is very thin mm -hmm. at 4,000 metres, uh, particularly because of where it is in, in, in the globe. So it's much thinner air than it is, say, in, in, in the middle of the uh, earth. Um, and it's unbelievably cold. So you're breathing in this very thin, very, very cold air and it gives you bronchial inflammation mm. so that you find it incredibly difficult to breathe, particularly at night, um, and you find yourself um, really gasping for air. And then to have to get up and walk when you're short of oxygen and you're tired, um, mm. that was really quite quite something to get through. Um, Wouldn't be good if you were asthmatic then? Uh, no, it would be <laughs> seriously challenging if you were asthmatic. And that's to some extent why, I mean, there's only about... 200 people that have actually walked to the South Pole mm -hmm. in any serious form uh, and, and and there's only 24 of us that have actually done the trip that I have actually done approximately um, and, and, and it's never going to get to be a popular thing to do because the whole experience yeah. is just so unbelievably alien to human uh, capabilities. So why did you choose it then? Simply because it was the hook by which I could get the message out yeah. about cancer, about early diagnosis, about eating better foods, mm -hmm. about being aware of yourself. The problem we have in this country is that we have got a demographic age wave. We're all going to live a hell of a lot longer. Mm -hmm. We could all live in very good health. 
but the National Health Service just isn't going to be there for us and if we therefore don't take ownership of our own health and look after ourselves, it's my view that the National Health Service simply cannot afford to look after us all mm -hmm. unless we're prepared to be far more proactive in looking after ourselves. And the hook to the South Pole is if I'd said to everybody, I just want to come and talk to you about how you look after yourself, it's too boring. If on the other hand you say, I'm going to go to the South Pole on the 100th anniversary that Shackleton yep. set off for his trip, that I'm going to get there on the 103rd anniversary when Scott arrived at the South Pole, it's in the DNA of the British people that it is just so iconic and it's something that resonates with young and old. It gives me a wonderful opportunity. I've got lots of presentations to make to schools, scout groups, mm -hmm. uh, to business, to all sorts of other people who are all fascinated by the whole idea of Antarctica. And then, of course, you can also get the message out about cancer and eating better foods and health awareness mm -hmm. and so forth. This morning I'm talking to Patrick McIntosh who's been trekking to the South Pole and he's uh, coming to join me in the studio here at Redstone Towers. So Patrick, what were your best and your worst moments about this experience? I think the best moment was the uh, obviously the arrival at the South Pole. Um, just the fact that we A, had made it, B, that uh, we... Uh, arrived on Scott's anniversary um, and that was a huge huge uh, uh, fillip to the whole uh, mm -hmm. thing. I think the worst moment was probably walking in the pea soup. Yeah. For uh, days on end you couldn't see anything, you were just staring at a compass you were feeling sick, you were freezing cold. I mean every day you had a, your, eye, your face was full of ice. Ooh. I mean it was just you can see some of the pictures on, on our blog you mm. can see that it was just it was uh, and those were those were really really difficult days to get through. So you've been back what just over a week now? So we arrived last Saturday. Yeah, it took us a week to get off uh, Antarctica. One doesn't realize I hadn't realized quite how difficult it is to get on to Antarctica and get off. It's not the sort of normal, you can only get there on a, a, a huge great cargo plane that's taking stuff to various research mm -hmm. stations and so forth. And it's very, very weather dependent, very weather dependent. Yeah. Uh, they don't have all the satellite navigation, partly because the magnetic poles moving around all over the place. So if they can't see where they're going to land, and bearing in mind you're landing on glaciers and so forth, mm -hmm. um, then they don't fly and it's as simple as that. It's very difficult. So has it taken you a while to get back into, well, civilization? Yeah, I've taken this week to sort of uh, get my head uh, sorted out. Um, I've got frost uh, nip on the ends of each of my fingers. Um, got a slightly strange left foot, which is slowly recovering. I lost a bit of memory, which apparently is quite common in the Antarctica. All right, okay. uh, and I lost my long vision, which again is very common because your your the functions that your body doesn't need mm -hmm. when you're at extreme temperature just close down, and it just concentrates on the things that you do need. My fingers um, crossed you'll get those back, though. Oh yes, apparently yeah. they, they they come back quite quickly, and and they're beginning to recover all the time. So when um, you decided to do this trip, I take it you had to get a medical from your doctor? or? Well, basically I got the all clear from my uh, prostate cancer specialist and my bowel cancer specialist and my skin <coughs> specialist in June last year. And that was really the first time I could then... So it was a bit of a last minute rush to uh, to, to take on the action. Um, but yes, they uh, said that the, as far as they were concerned, I was fit enough to do it. And so then it was a question of getting as fit as I possibly could mm -hmm. between then and December uh, and at the same time planning and organising the trip. Patrick, just remind us, how far did you walk each day? Uh, we walked approximately 20 kilometres. Some days it was a little bit less, 18. Sometimes it was a bit more, 21, 22 kilometres. But uh, at the average was uh, just over 20 kilometres and we did 222 kilometres over an 11-day period. So just... Um for people like me, dinosaurs who haven't moved on, what's that in mileage? It's about 138 miles. Wow. Uh, so it's uh, um, given the, you know, where you are on the harsh and you're dragging a sledge mm. and all the other bits and pieces, it's, uh, it's a pretty extreme. You're trying to move along at about three kilometres an hour, which mm -hmm. is uh, about two miles an hour, mm -hmm. which uh, doesn't sound an awful lot, but uh, I can assure you when you're dragging it across sticky snow, because mm. it is very sticky at that height, it's not like 
the snow we have here, which tend to be quite slippery, it actually is very clingy and very dry. Antarctica is one of the driest places on Earth, believe it or not, uh, and so therefore the snow doesn't uh, react in the same way that it reacts uh, when it snows here in Britain. Well, I must admit, it's about three degrees today, and I'm finding that cold. I've warmed up a bit now, but when I first came in here, I find it really difficult to use the faders on the desk. My fingers were just so cold. I do not do cold. But how did you cope with it being so cold there? Well, it is really quite extraordinary. So as you go into Antarctica, you go to a sort of a, co a collection station called Union Glacier, and you get mm -hmm. out this plane, and it's about minus 15 to 20, and you look at all these people who are wandering around in open neck shirts without any gloves on, and you think, this is ridiculous. How are they doing this? And you're feeling pretty cold. By the time we came back out, and we'd been experiencing temperatures of minus 30 to minus 40 at the South Pole, and we came back to Union Glacier on our way home, I suddenly found myself doing exactly the same thing. One's body adapts very rapidly, mm. so there I was wandering around with an open neck shirt and no gloves on. Probably um, felt because, like summer then. <laughs> and it, genuinely, you got out of the, you got out of this cargo plane that dropped you at Union Glacier, and it felt like a warm breeze by comparison with being at uh, uh, the South Pole. So it, it it is really strange the way in which you you adapt. And yes, I mean uh, today, as far as I'm concerned, it's a lovely warm summer's day, even though I appreciate that for most <laughs> yes. of it it's, it's jolly chilly. <laughs> but my body will go back to being mm. you know British and therefore you know I'll find it cold again in a few weeks time. <laughs> yeah so if you had to describe this trek in one word what word would you use? I think it I, I thought about this a lot I think there has to be two words it's exhausting <laughs> but exhilarating. Uh, it was uh, the most extraordinarily tiring thing mm. and that's why again humanity is never going to do it en masse mm. but on the other hand the beauty of the place, uh, the exhilaration, and just the fact that I am one of a very, very tiny, you know, when you think there's over seven billion people on this planet mm -hmm. and there's only a couple hundred people who have ever walked to the South Pole, it's a, it's a very exhilarating experience. I don't think I'd ever do it, but um, it does sound absolutely fantastic. And um, I noticed on your blog you were talking about the 24-hour daylight. That must have seemed really weird. Yeah, that is really weird. You, you know, you, you wake up in the middle of the night uh, relatively exhausted. And, and, and one, one occasion, because the sun was up and the wind, the wind almost always blows on the south, uh, mm. Antarctica, but on one occasion it actually went down to a very low level. And we found ourselves in a tent that was really quite hot in, in the sense that the solar gain through the, uh, the tent was really quite warm. And, 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 but the fact that at one o'clock in the morning, the sun is absolutely in the middle of the sky is just, and you never, you know, for, for 18 days on Antarctica, I never saw a night. It was just, it was just permanently day. Wow. Uh, and that does, that does do quite a lot for your body clock. I was going to say, it, it yes, it must really, really, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do you feel now knowing that you, you've actually achieved what you wanted to do? Well, I feel that I've achieved... The thing I really wanted to achieve was to get the awareness yes, message indeed, out, yes. to get the whole issue of trying to help people to uh, live with cancer better, to be more aware of it, to get the message to their loved ones, their family, their friends. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the phenomenal media attention that you and everybody else has given to this has helped me to get my message across which was my primary objective to try and yeah. get the the message across and so from that perspective um, I, I understand we've hit over 29 million people with the message from wow. stuff messages that we've sent from the South Pole from articles and newspapers and things like this so I, I, I feel that it's been absolutely justified and, and well worth it and uh, and I hope people will look at the KMG foundation dot blogspot mm -hmm. um, and, and see what's been going on and and take that message, particularly take it to their friends and family and loved ones and say, hey guys, if we're going to live in this world, we've got to take responsibility for our health. Yeah, indeed. And finally, you're recovering, you've got back safe and sound, and you're recovering now. Have you any plans for anything like this in the future? I promised my wife that I wouldn't uh, <laughs> do any more, but uh, it's a bit tricky. Uh, my granddaughter and I are going to do the Engadine Marathon mm -hmm. uh, in Switzerland in a month's time. Uh, 
uh, with on behalf of bowel cancer. So that's going to be a bit of fun. Um, I think, no, I actually want to concentrate for the next six months or so on just delivering the message, making the presentations, going to mm -hmm. scout groups and schools. And, yeah. and if any school wants me to come and talk about the experience, I'd be delighted to any social group or anybody else who'd like me to. I'm, I'm free, a pro bono. I'm very happy to come and give you. We've got a wonderful film coming out, uh, some great slides, some huge stories, uh, all sorts of things that I can talk to you about, particularly in respect of Conrad Dickinson, who's one mm -hmm. of the world's uh, f most famous uh, explorers um, and so between us uh, we've got huge tales to tell so very happy and that's what I'm going to concentrate the next six months on getting the message out. Well I'd love to talk to you for longer Patrick but um, unfortunately we have uh, run out of time but thank you very much for joining us here at Redstone FM and it's well can I, can I say congratulations. Thank you um, very much indeed and thank you for allowing me to speak on your No your, worries your no station. worries it's been lovely to, to meet you. Thank you very much. Patrick I'm Macintosh talking about his track to the South Pole don't think it's something I will be doing, but uh, wow, that's all I can say. Tess Lucy on Redstone FM.